Auroras are the beautiful light displays visible around the North and South Poles. Auroras around the North Pole are called Aurora Boralis or Northern Lights. Auroras around the South Pole are called Aurora Australis or the Southern Lights. There have been many historical explanations for what caused auroras. The word aurora actually came from the Latin word for dawn as auroras were previously thought to be the first light of dawn. Aboriginal Australians often associated auroras with fire. The Gunditjmara people of Western Australia called auroras pra bua, meaning ashes, whereas the Gunai people of eastern Victoria thought auroras were bushfires in the spirit world. The Deri people of South Australia believed auroras were an evil spirit called Kuchi, who was creating a large fire. There are also a variety of Native American myths surrounding auroras. One group of Native Americans, the Dene people, believed that auroras were the spirits of their departed friends dancing in the sky, and that when the auroras shone brightly, it meant that their deceased friends were very happy. Old Norse people had three possible explanations for auroras. The first was that the ocean was surrounded by vast fires. The second was that the sun's flares could reach around the world to the side that was experiencing night. And the third was that glaciers could store energy so that they eventually became fluorescent. In the 1740s, Benjamin Franklin theorized that an aurora was caused by a concentration of an electrical charge in the polar regions that is intensified by the snow and moisture in the air. In 1741, Anders Celsius and Olaf Rother were able to link large magnetic fluctuations with an aurora being observed overhead thanks to their observations of the movement of compass needles during the aurora. This evidence helped to support their theory that magnetic storms are responsible for compass fluctuation. All of these people were obviously not quite correct about how auroras occur. It was Christian Birkeland, a Norwegian scientist, who laid the foundation for our current understanding of geomagnetism and auroras in the early 1900s. I will now explain how auroras really occur, but first, there are two terms that need to be understood, magnetic fields and solar wind. Firstly, magnetic fields. The molten iron and nickel in the Earth's core rotates around the inner core. Due to the rotation of the liquid metals, convection and conduction of electricity, the hot iron and nickel creates a dynamo effect, generating a magnetic field. Like all magnets, the currents of the Earth's magnetic field flow out of one pole, loop down and flow to the other pole. These looping magnetic currents create the magnetic field, or magnetosphere, around Earth, which is kind of like a shield. The magnetic field extends about 64,000 kilometers around Earth and is shaped a bit like a teardrop, but it has holes in the north and south poles. Now, solar wind. The corona, which is the sun's outer layer, can reach temperatures up to 1.1 million degrees Celsius. The protons and electrons from the hydrogen and helium atoms in the corona can't be contained by the sun's gravity due to their high energy, which they gain from the heat of the corona. Consequentially, the particles stream away from the sun. These protons and electrons group together as plasma, which is an electrically charged gas. Now that we know what a magnetic field and solar wind are, we can understand how auroras are created. The protective magnetic field surrounding Earth shields it from the solar wind. However, the solar wind does distort the shape of the Earth's magnetic field by squashing the side closest to the sun and elongating the other side, which is why the magnetic field is a teardrop shape and not a sphere. When the magnetic field is overwhelmed by a large amount of solar wind, it creates an opportunity for the charged particles of the solar wind to reach the Earth's atmosphere. The large release of plasma in the solar wind is known as coronal mass ejection. When a coronal mass ejection collides with Earth's magnetic field. It overpowers the magnetic field and creates a magnetic storm. The storm stresses the magnetic field until it suddenly snaps back, similar to what happens when an elastic band is stretched too far. As the retracting band of the magnetic field moves back into place, some of the particles from the solar wind are flung towards Earth. These particles are brought to the aurora ovals, which are the holes in the magnetic field that I mentioned earlier. Larger coronal mass ejections result in more distortion of the Earth's magnetic field, which increases the size of the holes and allows for auroras to be seen further away from the poles. When the particles from the solar wind hit the oxygen and nitrogen atoms in the Earth's atmosphere, they transfer their energy, which puts the oxygen and nitrogen atoms into an excited state. As the atoms return to their ground state, they release the energy they had absorbed from the impact of the solar wind in the form of photons, which are small bursts of light. These photons are what create the visible auroras. The color of an aurora depends on the type and wavelength of the gas in the atmosphere when it was created. Oxygen atoms release photons at longer wavelengths, causing the auroras they create to appear green, yellow or red. Nitrogen atoms release high frequency wavelengths that are blue or purple.
Auroras are best seen on clear nights near the North and South Poles. Auroras cannot be seen during the daytime as the light of the sun is far brighter than them. Auroras aren't exclusive to Earth. Any planet with an atmosphere and a magnetic field have the potential to experience auroras. Auroras have been observed on both Jupiter and Saturn using the Hubble Space Telescope.